the defense will be uh, concluded. All right, so that, that is what um, we'll see. And Jenny, the uh, floor is yours. So when you're ready, um, go ahead and share your screen and, and you can get started. Thank you, John. That was a very nice introduction. And thanks everyone for coming to my defense today. I'm going to be talking about machine learning models and uncertainty for atomic simulations. And it is an honor to have professors John Kitchen, Zach Ulyssi, Mike Widow, um, Aditya Kerr, and Eric Yitzdi on my committee. Thank you for being here. Material simulation is a powerful scientific tool and it becomes even more so as we have an increase in computational power. And some of the things that we can do are calculate physical properties and investigate material behavior. These are not always easy to do using experiment. And we will show an example of this in the talk. And then we can also search an enormous space of materials and this helps us discover new catalysts and new materials. And Zach's group has been doing really great work on this. When we think about simulation of materials, there are multiple scales that are connected. At the smallest scale, we have atomic level, and we can do first principles, density functional theory, but we're limited in this, in this scale. And then on the continuum side, we, we don't have first principles. We have to make assumptions, and we can use empirical relationships. But these um, multiple scales are linked. And um, we can think about calculating a physical property using DFT and MD simulation, and then that property can be used in a continuum model. So these scales are linked. And as computing power improves, we can try to push the boundary of the time and length scales achievable by DFT and MD. And there are challenges regarding simulation. One of them is the trade-off between accuracy and computational expense. And DFT is highly accurate, but it is computational expensive. Traditionally, people use physical potentials that trade off um, accuracy for faster compute. And then another challenge is analyzing the simulation data that comes from the MD simulation. And a lot of times there are a huge amount of data that can be generated in the form of text files, and it can be Cartesian positions of the atoms along the time steps of the simulation. So we have to be able to efficiently analyze this data and extract the relevant information. And because we're using simulation and models, we want to know how much can we trust the results that we get. So this is a question of uncertainty. And in this talk, I will use machine learning to address these challenges. We have an interest in liquid alloys and they have many important applications. An example is turbine blades for jet engines that can improve the efficiency. And then there are many others. And it's an interest in terms of scientific uh, properties of the liquid alloys. And also in the industry, we're moving towards a systematic optimization of the metallurgical processes, such as solidification and casting. And a lot of the thermodynamic quantities are difficult to measure and experiment. And we can think about using atomic scale information and MD simulation to calculate these quantities. And then we can also calculate one of those quantities and use it in a continuum model, such as a comput computational fluids model. So again, we see the link between the different scales of simulation. And one of the interesting properties of these liquids is the Stokes-Einstein relation. And it is shown here, we have the effective diameter small d, and this is approximately constant over a range of temperatures. And we see this ratio is proportional to the temperature T over the viscosity, eta, and diffusion, large D. And this is an interest in the literature. There are many um, scientific studies of why this holds and why it breaks down in various liquids. Um, so it is an active area of research. And then from a practical standpoint, it's also useful. If we know that this relationship holds and we already have the diffusion, we can get the, the viscosity or vice versa. And a lot of times these quantities are not easy to get using experiments. And then on the plot on the right, we have a 
effective diameter versus temperature for liquid aluminum iron. And at the high temperature, we see that the effective diameter is, is approximately constant. And then it's not constant at, at temperatures below this temperature here. So we say this is a breakdown in Stokes-Einstein relation. And we are going to look at aluminum silicon in particular. And it is an important alloy for automotive, aerospace, and electronics applications. And it has some interesting properties. And one of those uh, properties is hysteresis, which means that the property, the physical uh, measurement changes depending on the thermal history of the material. So we have this example of a small angle neutron scattering plot, and we see that the measurement is different depending on the thermal history of the, of the material. And there are many literature studies of MD simulations for this system, and they did have some mixed results of the short range order. So we are taking a look at the system. And our objective in this part is to investigate the Stokes-Einstein relation and the local order in liquid aluminum silicon. We want to look at the local order because we think there are local structures that are important for the Stokes-Einstein relation. And then we need to, to, to do this, we need to calculate the viscosity and the diffusion at multiple temperatures. And we are using an angular dependent potential. This is a physical potential, and it was developed specifically for this alloy. Now I'm showing the results for the diffusion of viscosity. And for the diffusion, it was calculated using the slope of the mean square displacement. This is known as Einstein's method. And we see the plots on the right are diffusion versus temperature. And diffusion is increasing when temperature increases. And this is expected. And we also see that it follows the empirical Arrhenius equation for the entire temperature range. And then we, for viscosity, we are using the integral of the stress autocorrelation function, which is known as green Kubo's method. And on the plot, we have viscosity versus temperature and viscosity increases when the temperature decreases. And then we have some good comparable um, results with the experiment at a nearby composition. And we also find that the viscosity follows the empirical Arrhenius relationship, but there are two different temperature regimes. So the viscosity um, actually increases at a faster rate when we're at a lower temperature. And now I can look at the Stokes-Einstein relation here I'm showing the plots of effective diameter versus temperature. And at the high temperature, we see approximately constant effective diameter. And then at around melting point, we have a breakdown in Stokes-Einstein deviation. The, the effective diameter is no longer constant. And we say that this is a breakdown in the supercooled liquid range. So now we're gonna look at the local ordering and we're using a method called Voronoi tessellation. And what it does is it decomposes the points in space and assigns the points to the nearest atom. And then all this is shown, for example, in the 2D space. And then all of the points assigned to an atom make up the Voronoi polyhedron. And we identify atoms with icosahedral Voronoi indices. This is 0, 0, 12, 0. It means that the Voronoi polyhedron has 12 faces with five edges and zero other faces. And because it has 12 nearest neighbors, those atoms plus the center atom make up the icosahedral cluster. And this is shown in the bottom right. So we've assigned all the atoms, uh, we've identified the icosahedral clusters. And now we use agglomerative clustering to merge together clusters that have at least one shared atom. And these are uh, examples of the common merged clusters that we find in the system. And um, the reason why we're looking at icosahedral clusters is because it was found to have a correlation with the Stokes-Einstein relation breakdown. And it's also found to be important for liquid structure. So now we have assigned all the clusters in the simulation and we can do some analysis on their properties. So we find that the number of clusters increases when the temperature decreases. 
And we find the same thing happening for the size of the clusters and the time duration, or how long the cluster is lasting in simulation. So on the plot on the left, we have the uh, atoms in clusters versus temperature. And the blue is the total, and the orange is the max. We see that both of these are increasing when the temperature decreases. And then for perspective, we have a total of 1,099 atoms in clusters. Oh, sorry, atoms in simulation. And then at the peak, we have over 10% of the atoms in clusters, in icosan usual clusters. So this is a significant amount. And then there's a sudden drop because that's when the crystallization happens. And there's minimal icosahedral clusters after crystallization. And this is expected. And on the plot on the right, we have an example of a cluster that is lasting for longer than five picoseconds in the simulation. And this is a significant amount of time. Our simulation has a time step of one femtosecond. So five picoseconds is more than 5,000 time steps in the simulation. And we have observed these clusters. So this is because it's lasting for so long, we're saying that these are real significant clusters that we're observing. So now that we've looked at the clusters, we want to quantify what is the effect of the clusters on the diffusion and the viscosity. And to do this, we develop a per atom method calculation for diffusion and viscosity. And the per atom diffusion is an intuitive um, number because diffusion is already an, an average over atoms. And so to get the per atom diffusion, we just use the same calculation, which is the scope of the mean square displacement, but we um, only look at the subset of atoms that we're interested in. So on the plot on the right, I have the diffusion versus temperature in three different methods. The first one is the same one that we showed before. And then we have the per atom diffusion using all of the atoms and the per atom diffusion with the cluster atoms removed. And we see that they're all overlapping. So we're saying that the clusters have a minimal effect on diffusion. And for per atom viscosity, um, this is an approximate method and we use the Einstein method for uh, calculation of viscosity, and we use a per atom stress command in lamps. And then when we do the per atom viscosity with all of the atoms, we get approximately the same viscosity as the green Kubo method. So we think that this um, calculation is a, is a good approximation. And then when we remove the cluster atoms, we see that the viscosity is lower. And another way to think of it as the clusters tend to increase the viscosity. So now we look at the Stokes-Einstein relationship again. And here on the plots, I'm showing the per atom viscosity and diffusion and uh, the effective diameter versus temperature. And the plots on the left are aluminum 90, silicon 10. The plots on the right are aluminum 95, silicon 5. And the top plots have the cluster atoms removed from the calculation and the bottom plots include the cluster atoms. And we see that when we remove the cluster atoms, there is no longer so Einstein deviation, but when we include the cluster atoms, we do see the deviation. And so we're saying that the cluster effects on the viscosity and diffusion can explain this Stokes Einstein deviation. So the summary for this part, we investigated the relationship between atomic scale and continuum properties in liquid aluminum silicon. And we analyzed this local order using Voronoi tessellation and agglomerate clustering. This is a new method of applied uh, application. And it's a way that we can efficiently analyze the large data sets from MD trajectory. And this was one of the challenges that we identify with MD simulation. And then we show that the clusters have a minimal effect on diffusion, but they increase the viscosity. And this leads to the Stokes-Einstein deviation. And overall, it shows that MD simulation allows us to observe this new phenomenon. So now we, we think about the previous study and we say, okay, we used a physical potential and it's not as accurate as DFT. And this is one of the main motivations for the machine learning potential because it can be as accurate as DFT at a fractional computational cost. And what I'm showing here is the 
atomic configuration. And um, we can get a mathematical description of the local atomic environments. And this is going to be the input to the neural networks. And the output is going to be the energy and the forces on the atoms. So this is a potential because it's taking the atomic configuration and the output is the energy and the forces. And then we can fit these neural networks to DFT data. And this is what I'm showing here. And we have very good accuracy. Um, so this neural network potential can be as accurate as DFT, but it is orders of magnitude faster. So we did this for the nickel aluminum tungsten liquid alloy. And then we integrate it with MD simulation. And one of the key points that we found is we have to iteratively retrain the neural network potential. And the reason is because we put it, we train it, and then we put it in the MD simulation. And as the MD simulation runs, it goes farther and farther away from the training data. So um, yeah, it goes farther and farther away from the training data and it's going to extrapolate eventually. And this is a problem that's happening in machine learning in a lot of applications. And in the machine learning community, they call this data set shift. And one of the, the best ways that people found to combat this is just to augment the training, training data and just keep retraining with more data. So this we had to iteratively retrain the neural network potential multiple times. And um, we end up getting a good potential that's that's running with MBT simulation for 0.1 nanoseconds. And we get good results with ab initio uh, compared with ab initio. And so this wasn't really easy to do. And you know, we didn't have a good way to determine when the extrapolation is happening with the neural network potential. So this is one of the main motivation for why we want a quantitative uncertainty for, um, sorry why we want a quantitative uncertainty for these type of models. So I'm going to give an overview of what uh, uncertainty estimation methods people typically use. Um, the first one is ensemble bootstrap. And in this method, instead of training one model, you train multiple models. And um, you, you can use the prediction from the ensemble, the models in the ensemble, to give the variance or the uncertainty estimate. And in this method, it works well in a lot of cases, but it can be tedious to train multiple models and it can also be computationally expensive. And then another method is to use something like a Gaussian process. And this gives a built-in uncertainty and people can have also used like dropout for neural networks. And in this case, you are limited to a specific model form. Um, and also Gaussian process doesn't scale well with the number of training data. So we're gonna talk about the Delta method and this is fast and easy for a lot of situations. It works well and uh, for a lot of situations. And then you can have a pre-trained model and you can get the uncertainty after the model is trained. So this, is, this can be pretty convenient. You don't have to do additional training. And the downside is that it doesn't scale well with the number of model parameters. So the key point of the Delta method is that it uses the inverse Fisher information. And this is the formula that we have. G is the model. This is the standard error of the model prediction. And we need to take the gradient of the model with respect to its parameters at the input where we want the uncertainty. And then we need to take the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And the Fisher information is shown here. It is the Hessian of the negative log likelihood. And in a lot of uh, regression problems, this is the same as the sum of squared errors objective. And so when we do this, we have the training data and the model. We train the model with minimizing sum squared errors. Then we can calculate the Hessian. We take the inverse and scale it by factor, and we can calculate the gradient and just follow the formula. So the Hessian and the gradient, we don't have to take these derivatives by hand. Um, we just use automatic differentiation. And a lot of times it's only one line of code. And then there's also some numerical tricks that we use to stabilize the inverse Fisher information. And you can take a look at the uh, paper for those details. 
So I'm showing an example for the single neural net potential and single neural net was developed by Ming Jia from our group. And um, in this example, we have a neural net architecture of four input dimension, two hidden layers with 11 nodes each and two output dimension. So that's a total of 211 parameters. And our data is DFT energy and forces for AUPD slabs. And then we train this with single neural net and PyTorch and we use beta parallel fingerprints. That is like a weighted coordination number. And then we calculated these uncertainties afterwards after training with the Delta method in PyTorch. And I'm gonna show the results if we we're imitating iteratively building up this neural network potential. So first we have a first iteration with data that is from configurations with the 3.9 angstrom lattice. And we randomly split that data set into trained validation and test sets. And I'm showing the test parity here, and it's very good parity. And we see the 95% prediction interval. And the actual data is falling within the prediction interval 98% of the time. So this is quantitatively close to 95%. And it shows that the uncertainty is quantitatively accurate. And then uh, now we want to predict on some new data sets. So this is predict 4.0 and 4.1 because it's from a 4.0 and 4.1 inch from lattice configurations. And we see that the error bars are now much, much larger. Um, they're actually 10 times larger than the test error bars. And um, we see the parity, it's offset from parity. And then we see that the quantitative accuracy of these error bars are not as high anymore. So the main point is that uh, because the error bars are so high, we don't trust our model anymore for this data. And this, this shows how that the Delta method is, is able to get the uncertainty, is, is able to get the extrapolation and the data set shift. And now we have to retrain these models. So we retrain with 64% of the predict 4.0 and 4.1 data sets. And that's around a total of 700 data points. And then um, we see that after retraining, the parity is very good. We have 95% um, prediction intervals. And then we also see the standard error of confidence is very low. And so the 95% prediction interval, the actual uh, values fell into the prediction interval 98.7% and 98.5% of the time. So after we retrained, we're no longer extrapolating on this data and our uncertainties are low. So the uh, Delta method also works you know, for retraining. So the summary of this part, we talked about the Delta method and it works well when we have a pre-trained model and we can get the uncertainty after, after training. And then it works well for small to medium nonlinear regression models. It's, it's pretty fast and convenient in those cases. And we show that the standard errors can determine the extrapolation and the data set shift. And this is very, very important if we want to reliably use our machine learning potentials in MD simulation. So we're going to talk about a more general view of uncertainty now. And um, the, the idea here is that physical properties can, it can be calculated from models. And the general process is that first we collect some data. It could be experimental or ab initio. And then we do modeling. And this could be such as an equation of state. It could be a kinetic model or differential equations like heat and mass transfer. And then we derive a property. So we can take a minimum of the model. That would give us an equilibrium property. We could take a derivative. And in the equation of state, we take the second derivative and we can get the bulk modulus. And then we can also get reaction rate, thermal diffusivity, and many others. And we can have uncertainty from any of these steps. So uh, under the data collection, we can have inherent randomness or observation error, experimental error. And these are what people usually call aleatoric uncertainty. And then under modeling, we can have uncertainty from the train data that we used and the data that we're now predicting on. So this was the extrapolation or the data set shift that we talked about in the previous section. And we can also have um, uncertainty from which model to use. So what was the best model to use in the first place and the model parameters. 
And these are what people call epistemic uncertainty, and it reflects a lack of knowledge about something. And then we need to consider, can we get the uncertainty with respect to the derivation? And we'll see that this is not always obvious. So I'm going to give a overview of the different ways of thinking about modeling in terms of frequentist and Bayesian perspective. And uh, we're going to talk about the frequentist side first, because this is most familiar to chemical engineers. And we have some data X and Y. We have a model F with parameters theta and error epsilon. And the probabilistic quantity of interest is likelihood, which is the conditional probability of Y given X theta and epsilon. And then when we solve this, we end up getting a point estimate for the model parameters theta. So it's only one set of parameters and it's our best guess of what the theta is based on the data that we observed. And then the way that we solve this is by maximizing the likelihood and we can assume Gaussian error and that ends up being ordinary regular least squares regression. And to get the uncertainty, we can use the Delta method and um, this, you know, this allows us to obtain the standard error. And then on the Bayesian side, we can draw this as a graph. And in the graph, we have nodes, the circles that are random variables, and the arrows that represent the dependency. And now the probabilistic quantity of interest is the joint distribution. So it's the uh, distribution over all of the variables in the graph. And then we can factorize this according to the graph, and it factorizes into the priors time the likelihood. And um, this comes about because of Bayes' rule and the, the definition of conditional probability. And now what we're usually most interested in is the posterior distribution. So this is the distribution of the uh, model parameters given the observed data. And then we get the solution. We solve this using exact inference, variational inference or Monte Carlo methods. And the uncertainty is now automatically included because we have the posterior and that was the distribution. Yeah, that's a probability distribution. So the um, uncertainty is already included. And then we can think about ensemble bootstrap as being in the middle between these two sides of the spectrum because every model from the ensemble is like a sample of the Bayesian posterior, but it is solved in the frequentist setting. And previously we mentioned Gaussian process, so I'm going to give an introduction. And we have some data X and Y, and we want to predict F of X star from the test inputs X star. So this is the definition. F is a Gaussian process if for any finite collection X, X star, the output is joint multivariate normal. And once again, we want to get the posterior, which is the uh, conditional probability of our prediction, F star, given X, Y, and X star. And this is exact through the conditional rule for multivariate normals, because we know that the joint uh, distribution over the graph is multivariate normal. We just use the conditional rule for multivariate normals and transform the joint distribution to the posterior distribution or to, to transform it to the conditional distribution. And then this posterior is also multivariate normal and it has the mean and covariance shown. And then if we look at this example, we have these dots, which are some observed noisy data from sine of X. And these blue lines are the samples from the posterior after we absorb this data. So the objective in this part, we show that there are multiple sources of uncertainty and we are gonna be particularly interested in the epistemic uncertainty uh, regarding the model selection and the model parameters. And then we also show that there's multiple ways to think about uncertainty and there's multiple methods that we can use to calculate it. So we are going to try to, to determine what sources of epistemic uncertainty are included in these different methods. And the methods that we're looking at are 
delta method, Bayesian regression, and Gaussian process. And we're looking at an equation of state. Um, and we're going to look at the physical properties of energy, volume, and bulk modulus. Bulk modulus is shown here. And the equation of state, there's been many analytical forms over the years. And some of these, for example, are Anton Schmidt, stabilized Jelly and Birch, and et cetera. And it's not always obvious which equation of state is going to be the best one for a particular system. So there is a question of model selection uncertainty for this problem. And the data that we're looking at is DFT data from SEC, Palladium, and Gold. And these were data from two papers by Jacob Bose. And he actually used all the data that's shown in these plots. But for our results, we're only using the shaded region. So if you use these a different set of data, you actually get a very different answer. Um, but all of our results are going to be with respect to the shaded region. So we're going to show the results for delta method and Bayesian regression. And in these plots, we have the top row is palladium, the bottom row is gold, and then the columns are the physical properties. So we have equilibrium volume, equilibrium energy, and bulk modulus. And then we, we have the delta method uh, confidence bars here. And then we have the blue distribution is the Bayesian regression posterior that's um, calculated from Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And we see that the delta method and the Bayesian regression um, uncertainties are pretty consistent with each other. So that's good. And then what we really want to, what we're really interested in when we look at this is within each of these boxes, um, how does the two models compare with each other? Yeah. So I guess if you look at the bulk modulus, you see that um, it's easy to see that these uncertainties are not overlapping with each other at all. So it doesn't include the model selection uncertainty. And you also see it for something like if, if you had trained a Birch model and you got this distribution for equilibrium energy, this uncertainty isn't telling you that if you had used a different model for your Tarantola, you would have gotten a different equilibrium energy. So we're saying that these uncertainties are model specific because it's mainly capturing the model parameter uncertainty. It's not capturing uncertainty with regard to the model selection. So now we're going to look at the Gaussian process and we want to include derivatives in the joint. Um, and this is because we, we need to calculate the bulk modulus and the minimum volume. So previously we had X and X star train and text inputs. Now we want to add a derivative observation. So we can just think about concatenating these derivative observations together. And yeah, if we have these X and X star inputs, we can just concatenate it. And this can be an arbitrary number and arbitrary location for these inputs. And then the posterior mean and the covariance is the same as before, nothing changed. The only thing is that we need to update the K matrices. And this is an example of KXX. If we have these um, uh, function and derivative observation concatenated in this way, then the covariance matrix here becomes blockwise. And we have to take into account the derivative, uh, the, the covariances across derivatives. So that is actually the derivative of the kernel with respect to the input that we want the derivative. And then if we look at the posterior with the derivative observations, this is the same example as before with the sign, noisy sign observations. Um, but in the top plot, we're also including some first derivative observations. And we see that um, because of those first derivative observations, the posterior around the true function is now tighter. And we can also sample the posterior to get the first derivative samples. So now I'm showing the results for the Gaussian process. And um, this is the posterior for the palladium equation of state. The top is the equation of state. Then we have the first derivative and the second derivative. And the key point is that we set up our model so that every time we sample the Gaussian process, we get 
one set of the equation of state, the first derivative and the second derivative, and that these are corresponding with each other. And then for each sample from the Gaussian process, we can exactly calculate the bulk modulus, the minimum volume, and the minimum energy. So we sample the Gaussian process, and then we get these distributions over the physical properties that we're interested in. And I'm showing the uh, distributions for the bulk modulus and the minimum volume. And for the Gaussian process, the distribution is in blue. And we see that it covers pretty much all of the equation of states that could possibly be the true equation of state, all of the different models. And when we look at the Bayesian regression or the Delta method, it doesn't uh, cover the other models. So we say that the Gaussian process uncertainty is model general. It, it includes uncertainty that you could get from model selection. So the summary for this part, um, we, talk, we talked about the Delta method we showed in the, the Bayesian regression um, posteriors. We showed that those results are consistent with each other and that they are model parameter uncertainty. And then the Gaussian process also includes model selection uncertainty. And then when would you want to use one over the other? If you are looking at the Delta method, you could use it when there's an analytical model, when it's like algebraic and it's pretty simple. And you think that the error residual is going to be independent, identically distributed Gaussian centered at zero. And when you can take the derivative of the physical property with respect to the model parameters. So if all of those are true, then you want to use the Delta method. And the downside is that it scales poorly with the number of model parameters. And then for the probabilistic graphical model, the Bayesian regression falls under this. And the good thing about it is that it's, it's very general. You can incorporate domain knowledge more flexibly. So if you think that one of your model variables is coming from a different distribution, like a Poisson or Bernoulli, you can incorporate that knowledge. And then you can also incorporate knowledge about the independence and the conditioning between the, the variables in your model. And the downside is that it's generally harder to solve. And then for the Gaussian process, we show that it, you know, if you don't know which model is the best one to use, the Gaussian process is going to include that uncertainty because it covers the model selection uncertainty. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so commonly used in Bayesian optimization, because um, a lot of times for Bayesian optimization, you don't know what the best model is. And um, so the Gaussian process works well there. And the downside is that it scales poorly with the number of training data. But there's a lot of research being done in this area. So the conclusions overall, we found the significant clusters in liquid aluminum silicon. We show that the clusters have a measurable effect on viscosity, but less so on diffusion. And this explains the Stokes-Einstein deviation. And we use these new uh, clustering and per atom methods. So these were new methods. And overall, this shows a linkage between multiple scales of simulation. It also shows that we can observe new phenomena using MD simulation. And then we integrated the ML potential with MD simulation for the complex um, nickel aluminum tungsten alloy. And we also show that the Delta method can determine extrapolation and data set shift for machine learning potentials and atomic environments. And this is very important if we want to reliably use the ML potentials with MD simulation. And then we contributed to better understanding of which sources of uncertainty are captured by different methods. And for future work and outlook, we see that there are many interesting research directions. One is Bayesian optimization and chemical engineering. And there's this very nice paper in Nature that's talking about this. They use Bayesian optimization and Gaussian processes to determine uh, the best design of experiments and the best chemical reaction uh, experimental conditions. And then their Bayesian optimization outperformed the human experts in selecting the next best um, reaction conditions for chemical reactions. And then another area is differentiable molecular dynamics. And there are some frameworks that were developed, such as JAXMD. And right now, you know, it's difficult to integrate the ML potential with MD simulation. So this can make it easier to do that. And we can get faster experiments, uh, more, more iterations. And the other thing is that we can do some 
more things because the uh, this allows us to differentiate through an ND simulation. So this is a paper called Differential Trajectory Reweighting. And in it, it was training a machine learning potential from a top-down approach, meaning that it, it um, trained it based on some physical property that came out of the MD simulation instead of training it from DFT data and training it up. So they have their code online if you're interested. And then uh, another area is the convolutional and translation rotation invariant machine learning potentials. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in this field. And um, we see a lot of the state of the art models uh, for different benchmarks are models of this form. So if you're interested, you can take a look at Zach's open catalyst data set and community challenges. And then we also see uh, Gaussian processes as a differential equation solver. There are some papers on this topic and we think this could be interesting for engineers and uh, it could potentially have applications for like computational fluids. And the acknowledgments, I wanna thank my advisor, John Kitchen. Yes, it's been very, very great working with John and I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, John has been so supportive the, the entire time. Yeah, and it's, it's really funny because we started out and, and I met like John over video call and I, I decided I wanna be in John's group. And then, um, so yeah, we kind of like come full circle and now and uh, yeah, it's been really great working with John. I learned so much from him and I would not be here today without him and without his help. Thank you, John. And I want to thank my committee, Professor Zach, Professor Widom, Professor Zaditia, and Eric for their extremely valuable input. And I want to thank my collaborators on the nickel and the tungsten work and collaborators on many other projects. And I want to thank the professors and the mentors who helped me um, during undergrad and over the years. And I want to thank my friends and my parents and thank you for attending my defense. And that concludes my presentation.